Shalom and Happy Biblical New Year. We're returning to the series on the signs in the heavens, how the uh, astronomical signs associated with the Hebrew months line up with the festivals in those months. And today we're going to cover the month of Nisan. As we have discussed before, there are names that the people brought out of Babylon for these for the months. And uh, in general, in past times, they were just the first month, the second month, and so on. But some of these Babylonian names are listed in the Tanakh, and Nisan is one of them, in Nehemiah 2.1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine, and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. In Esther 3.7, we know that uh, we, last month is all involved around the story of Esther, and it actually begins around this time because the whole process took one year. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of Ahasuerus, they cast the poor, that is the lot, before Haman, from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. So they started and the lot fell for uh, Haman thought he would kill the Jews in the twelfth month about one year later. The name Nisan though has some biblical cognate roots and one of these is Nasa. And Nasa is the idea of uh, proving something, testing something to see what will come out of it. In Genesis 22, 1, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, He neni, behold, here I am. So it's not like God set up something to, to try and get Abraham to come off the path to do something that was uh, un, un commanded or unbiblical if we want to look at it from that perspective but he wanted to Abraham to know what was inside Abraham himself and how he would handle a certain very difficult situation the idea of sacrificing Isaac his only son so tempt maybe is probably not the best translation Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not tempt Yahweh your God as you tempted him in Masa. So the name of the place, Masa, comes from this root, Nasa, to tempt. Um, we, we can't tempt God to do something unbiblical, but we can test him. We can try and prove him in the way that we prove metal to see, uh, silver or gold, to see how pure it is. Here is perhaps the best translation, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to prove him with hard questions. She is going to give him a test and see what is he really made of what's inside of him. We also see this uh, root noose, uh, which means to flee or to run away. Genesis 19.20, Behold, the city is near to flee unto it, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So this is Lot uh, running away before Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. In Numbers 35.6, we see the uh, commandment about the cities of refuge. And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which ye shall appoint for them manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them ye shall add forty and two cities. There's also this root ness, uh, which means uh, an ensign or a pole or a standard, uh, something that would hold the flag, which is connected to the idea of um, fleeing. If you are, for example, in battle, you're going to look up in the sky to see where are your troops so you can get to that place, so you can flee to that place. So this is a pole with a standard on it, something we can see from far away, and we know that that's going to be our place of refuge or our place of safety. Numbers 21.8 And Yahweh said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, a ness. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten 
when he looketh upon it, shall live. Isaiah 11, 10 and 12. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the nations seek, and his rest shall be glorious. He shall set up an ensign for the nations, and assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And of course, this is Yeshua. People look up to him. The whole picture of the serpent on the pole represents Yeshua. He himself says later, if I be lifted up, then I will draw all men to me. And that's a picture of him being the ensign, being on that pole. All people can see him and flee to him. You might be familiar with this word Ness if you celebrate Hanukkah at all. And you have what's called a dreidel. In Hebrew, a svivon means just going around and around. And it has four letters on it, the nun, the gimel, the hay. If you live uh, outside the land, you have a shin. If you live inside the land, uh, you have a pay. So those letters stand for Nes Gadol Hayasham or Nes Gadol Hayapo. The miracle, the great one, was either there or here. Nes Gadol Hayasham. And uh, the miracle, of course, is the miracle of the Maccabees. And so in uh, post-biblical Hebrew, into modern Hebrew, Nes also means a miracle. Another set of related roots that we want to look at for the month of Nisan, uh, one is Nutz. And this has to do with the idea of um, a bud sprouting forth. And uh, also we're going to see that it's related to the idea of, of fleeing. Song of Songs 611. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine had flourished and the pomegranates budded. In Lamentations uh, 415, they cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, not, not touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, They shall no more sojourn there. So something springing forth, either the bud of a flower or a person springing forth from his place and he's running to another place. And so it's also related as the idea of a spark. Isaiah 1 31 and the strong shall be as tow and the maker of it as a spark and they shall both burn together and none shall quench them uh, another name for this season is called aviv some people say that the correct name of the month is aviv but we're going to see in a minute that that is not a name of something but it indicates a time period uh, exodus 23:15. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I have commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Eve. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. So we see in the translation, it looks like that the name of the month is Aviv. But if you look in the Hebrew, uh, where it says, Hayom atem yotzim b'chodesh ha Aviv. In other words, it's the month of the Aviv, and Aviv indicates something very specific. It has to do with a certain development of the barley in the field. Exodus 9:31, and the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the fax was flax was bold. So it's talking about a specific a stage of development of these different plants and that's what aviv means leviticus 2:14 and if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the lord thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears that's what is translated from aviv of corn dried by the fire even corn beaten out of full ears so it's talking about a stage of development in uh, crops. This is the first month as it is given in Exodus 12 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And you know already that there are several holidays celebrated uh, in, the, in the one week of this month. 
Numbers 9, 5, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that Yahweh commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. So this is the time of the Passover. We see, clearly see the connection to the fleeing, to the people being tested. Uh, are they going to put the blood on the doorposts? Are they going to leave? Are they going to follow Moses? We also see that this is the month of unleavened bread, Exodus 12, 18. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, you shall eat leavened, unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. <clears throat> the other holiday that's mentioned here is only mentioned once. It's in Leviticus 23, 14, and 15. And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So we see the week of matzah, of eating unleavened bread, and then we see... This holiday, which is sometimes called first fruits, it is the first fruits of the barley, barvi- barley harvest. However, it's not actually called first fruits. It's the beginning of the counting of the Omer. It is the first Omer. Now, concerning all these festivals, I have a lot of other uh, presentations, YouTube presentations, and uh, the links for all those are listed here. And so you can look further into the connections between the season and what each festival has in meaning and spiritual history, things like that. So I encourage you to look at those things. So we see that the astronomical sign for Nisan for this period of time is Aries the Ram. In Hebrew, it is called Taleh, and it actually means a lamb. There's a lot of words, different words used for different kinds of livestock. So even though the word lamb might appear uh, in other places, it doesn't use this word tale, but here it does use it um, in these verses here, for Samuel 7, 9. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto Yahweh. And Samuel cried unto Yahweh for Israel, and Yahweh heard him. Also in Isaiah 65, 25, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith Yahweh. It would be difficult to imagine a more appropriate sign in the sky for this period of time. Moses taught the children of Israel, Exodus 12:21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. It's not the same word for lamb, but a baby sheep is a baby sheep. In John 1:29, we know the next day John seeth Yeshua coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yeshua is a Passover Lamb. A related word, Talah, we see in Genesis 30, 32. I will pass through all the flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats of such shall be my hire jacob uh, earning his wage among uh, laban's family so this idea of spotted and um comes to uh, be associated with this word tala again in ezekiel 16 16 and of thy garments thou didst take and dex thy pie places with diverse colors and place the harlot thereupon the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. So we have this idea of discoloration. Again, applicable to Yeshua, Isaiah 53, 5. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Those spots and blemishes that occurred to him because of our sin, because he took our sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, like the matzah, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, like the matzah, for even Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He took our iniquity, he took our spots and blemish. Uh, Paul promises in Ephesians 5.27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So that is our goal as a bride of Messiah. A cognate word spelled with a tav, tala, means to hang. In Genesis 40.19, we see um, what's going to happen to the baker who is in jail in prison with Joseph. Within three days, Pharaoh, lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee upon a tree and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. We know that Yeshua similarly was, um, was hanged on a tree. Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised up Yeshua whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Back to the root with the tet, there's a related word tal, which means do. This comes from the idea, uh, initially the lamb, going back to the spots, that, the, that there's a weakness. The thing that has the spots has a weakness in it, and it needs to be covered. Um, and the little lambs need to be covered by the shepherd. They need to be looked after. And this is dew. The dew comes, as we know, and covers the grass or the ground. Genesis 27, 28. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine, a blessing. Numbers 11, 9. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So this associates the manna with the dew. We're going to look at that in one minute. Deuteronomy 32, 2. My doctrine shall drop as a rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, as the showers upon the grass. Concerning the manna, the manna was the food, it's a bread. John 6, uh, some verses between 48 and 58. I am that bread of life. He spoke of himself. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So the dew being associated with the manna, being associated with the bread of life. Uh, in terms of the doctrine, as Moses spoke that his teaching was distilled as the dew, he um, also is spoken of Yeshua. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the dew is always thought of as nourishing the people, um, just as it nourishes the land, and the land can produce food. Now, the dew is spoken of frequently as coming from heaven, but in fact, dew doesn't fall in the way that rain falls. A dew, more like in Deuteronomy, it says it is distilled. It appears to come from nowhere, and then it, it covers the ground. It, we know that it condenses out of the air due to the temperature differences between day and night. But it suddenly appears. It doesn't fall like rain. We can't see it like rain or snow. But out of the air, it appears. And it, it manifests itself. And then it evaporates and goes back up into the heavens. So it sounds very much like a Passover situation. Here is Yeshua. He's kind of comes from out of time. And he's distilled into the time period in the first century and at the end of the uh, 
Passover, the time uh, after he's hung on the tree and he's in the grave, and then he rises back up into heaven. So very much like dew. And of course, he is the manna, which comes with the dew, and he does feed us. This root tal, uh, which means dew, is also the source of the word talit, which you know is a prayer shawl. And again, it comes from the idea of covering. I'm going to leave you with an interesting scripture from Micah 5.7. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from Yahweh, as a showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from Yahweh. I pray that you have a fruitful time at Passover, that you are able to take an inventory, clean the leaven out of your house and out of your life, and just rejoice with your families, uh, whether they be biological or spiritual. Until next time, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.